Here we go. Good morning. We're glad you came to worship with us on Father's Day. We invite you to stand as we worship.
Graydon and Tyrone's and Caden's group, he said to Jaden, he said, can I just go home with you, Jaden? And Jaden said, uh, I'm only 18, I don't think that will work. And he goes, sure, you can adopt me if you're 18. <laughs> so I thought that was, that was great. So that means he did a fine job. So we appreciate all of our workers. And um, before we, before I do announcements, I just want to say that I have, I have 16 teenagers who have signed up for teen camp. It is that later in July, and I have ha I've had come in to date $875 towards teen camp, and I need, we are short, $2,725. It's a very costly event. It's a costly event, and for our kids to go, the great majority of them cannot afford to pay their way. And so we need, um, we need them to do some work for you. If you have some yard work that needs to be done, if you, please, please, please ask a teenager. Um, I know there was a snafu with time with one, one group of kids that were going to help uh, Jerry and Barbara, and I apologize for that, but the group that came over and helped Pastor Dave and me, they did great. So if you have work around your house or anything that you can think of that a teenager could do to help raise money so that they could go to camp, that would be wonderful. Or if you just want to say, I want to sponsor a child, it's $225. You say, well, maybe I don't have $225. Well, maybe you could do $50 or $100. And a lot of people putting money together makes a big difference. And I want to remind everybody that when I was growing up, my family was poor. We came to church on a bus and rode a bus. It was an old 1946 bus, school bus that they had repainted and put the Church of the Nazarene sign on the side of it. And I rode that bus with my family. My family came on that bus every Sunday and every Sunday night and every Wednesday night they would come pick us up on that bus faithfully. And I rode that bus and I was saved at a Church of the Nazarene teen camp. And it made a difference in my life. And teen camp and children's camp can make a life-changing amazing event happen for our kids. So if you can help sponsor a teenager, I would really, really appreciate that. And if you could let me know, I have the list right here. So um, just a few reminders. Um, we are going to be painting the gym floor, which takes lots of help. Mr. Rick has volunteered to um, head that up. And I understand that Jaden, Jaden's like all into volunteering lately. He's going to help with that. So they're going to start work on Monday, June 25th, so a week from tomorrow, and finish up by Friday, July, July 6th. And Rick needs at least six helpers. And we're talking serious mature. work helpers, mature helpers. Um, so it's not a playtime. This is a, a serious work that, that we need done. <laughs> Put you down? Okay. Did you hear that, Rick? Put the matrix down. Got it? Okay. All right. So um, just also reminders that we are continuing to have our uh, meal program for children and teenagers on Wednesday nights, and that is working out great. And we so appreciate how the Lord provided all of that food. I mean, they, they brought us, Wednesday night, they brought us Publix fried chicken. And, and guys, we didn't have to pay for so the, it's a government-assisted program, but it, they're providing food for our kids on Wednesday night, and we really, really appreciate that. So um, if you can help with surfing or anything, please let us know on that as well. Joanne is coordinating all of that, and we appreciate that so much. Would you stand this morning and greet one another?
service, maybe not even thinking about this. But the enemy of the kingdom of God, Satan is going around through every place possible trying to destroy every one of our families, even to this day. He's trying to break you down. He's trying to tell you you're not important. He's trying to remind you that you've had failure, that you've, you can't seem to make the grade or whatever it may be. And, and he's trying to pump all this negativity of thoughts in your mind, saying it's impossible to walk this Christian life. We know better, don't we? Jesus didn't just die, but he rose again that you and I can have life everlasting. He's not just someone who lived a long time ago. He's alive today. We're just not about that. He's alive today. And as we bow in time of worship, let's just offer a time of prayer unto him today. Would you join me today as we pray? Our Father, we thank you as we're about to receive for you these tithes and this offering for your glory. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for providing that we can continue to reach and meet needs in the community. Thank you that we can help see people's lives change for all eternity because of the name of Jesus Christ. Father, for the needs been mentioning for Mary, for Grant, for Emma Jean's family, oh Father, and other needs that's been unmentioned that are here even this morning. Our Father, we just ask your blessings over everyone who's here, and may your living spirit May you come through each and every pew today. May you speak to our hearts and our lives and remind us that we are not left as orphans. We're not left comfortless, for your Holy Spirit is here to remind us that you love us with an everlasting love. Thank you again for your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen.
want to recognize um, our fathers and our father figures. Because not everybody in here is a father that's, and they have a, a child, but so many of our men who have not had children are father figures right. to our congregation. And we cannot thank them enough Amen. for their godly leadership that they have provided through the years. And I think Miss Karen... Did you say figures? Because I have one. <laughs>
don't have the figure that I have. <laughs> but we appreciate you, Ben. All you men, we appreciate you so much, every one of you. Amen. Praise God. Happy Father's Day. Amen. You can have the rest of the day off. <laughs> you don't have to do any dishes today. You don't have to fix any lunch today. Well, that may not be true. Some of you probably have to go out and grill and stuff like that. Maybe not. But hey, congratulations. Hey, my dad, I've got some great stories of times when growing up with him as well. And um, one of them, I found a picture that reminded me of a story my dad told me a long time ago. He would take me places when my dad wasn't a Christian. He would uh, take me places that I wasn't supposed to be. He used to be a part of a, something called the Moose Club and then later the VFW. And that's just where he was rolling in those days. And so he'd sneak me in. And he'd say, these three words he taught me real well. Don't tell mom. Really four words, I guess, with a contraction. But three words if you look at it. Don't tell mom. He'd take me places that I wasn't supposed to be. And he'd say, don't tell mom. Did anyone ever have that same thing? And it transferred down to my brother. Then later when he was speeding, doing 100 and some miles an hour in his car, he said, don't tell mom or dad. I said, about what? He says, good, I'll take you the next time as well. Hey, maybe you've had those kind of days. Today, I want to continue on with this theme for the month of bridge to the future. A bridge that means you go from one destination to the next destination. You have a starting place of a lot of times with faith. Remember those times you started off a business adventure or you're going to a new school or you're taking your first driver's test, some kind of a rite of passage when you're in your life. Maybe it was a time of getting married. The time that you worked out all the details and you go from one place to another, but there's a place that you cross over and we call it the bridge. In this bridge, sometimes that can be really terrifying because on the left or the right, sometimes you see some really terrifying events. But if you'll cross that bridge and if you'll stay on your journey and you'll continue to put your trust in God, God will take you places you've never even imagined ever before. He'll help you to see new things that you haven't even seen before. He'll help you to meet people that you've never, ever met before. It's an incredible journey if you'll be open and not be fearful, but put your trust in God. Today, what I want to share with you is found out of a, in the Old Testament, out of Joshua. You might want to turn there, because I have some verses I want to have you follow along with me. If you have a worship folder, you might want to take that and see the outline as well. I really was looking forward to hearing Bill today. You probably were too. Amen. Praise God. Okay, we got that out of the way. But <laughs> you're stuck with me today. So I'm so glad you're able to be here this really this good morning. Today I want to talk about the lessons that God is teaching us through an incredible biblical lesson on leadership through a man's life named Caleb. Joshua and Caleb are found in the Old Testament here in this book of Joshua, chapter 14. And throughout this passage, you will find uh, some incredible things, what God has done within their lives. Within Caleb's life, though, he helps us understand his viewpoint from the things he had to face. And there are three words that he is reminding us out of this passage today. Uh, three words that all dads, all male figures, all folks, actually you, doesn't matter who we are, if we'll trust God, he'll give this to all, all of us. These are three words. One's called courage. The second one is called listening. And the third one is called trust. So we're going to look at courage, listening, and trust today. And I'm going to start with the first one, if I may. I believe it's in verse 7 of Deuteronomy chapter 34. Actually, it really started back in Numbers. And what had happened, it was a time when Moses had said that uh, the people were complaining because they're out wandering in the wilderness and they're thirsty. You ever had days you're just thirsty? It seemed like you couldn't seem to find the water. Anywhere. You just, oh, I just need a drink of water so much. Well, Moses goes and talks to the Lord about it. And God tells him, says, speak to this rock. And the water will come gushing out. It's around Numbers 22. And uh, Moses goes back. And here's what, here's what you need to understand. If you ever want to know what... The sinful nature is inside of humanity. The thing that causes us to lie, to cheat, to break those, some of those things that Stephen had mentioned earlier as well, is because the original sin inside of us needs a cleansing. It needs a touch, a fresh touch from God. 
And even in the Old Testament, they demonstrate because Moses comes back from being in the presence of Almighty God, and he comes up and he sees the people, and they say, Moses, can you help us? What are we going to do? Will God help us? He says, what am I supposed to do? Do I need to take my staff and strike this rock so water will come gushing out? You see, God had given Moses a staff of power and authority, so to speak, and his authority was that God had destined to help get the children of Israel out of Egypt to go into the promised land. Well, now he's using that same tool to kind of make it sound as if he had the authority. And that's what original sin is all about. That's what the sin nature is in humanity. It talks about that I'm going to get what's mine, whether you like it or not. I don't care about you. I'm going to take care of me. That's what it's saying. And Moses wanted the attention. And he kind of comes up and strikes that rock. Water comes gushing out. And the people are able to drink and they're satisfied. The problem is, God said to speak, not strike the rock. Huge difference. It starts with the same letter in the alphabet, I know. But if we don't obey God, we have a struggle there. And what the problem was, because of his sin, in the end of Deuteronomy chapter 34, the Bible says, they've come up to the edge of the promised land. They've come right to the very edge. But God said, you will not make it into the promised land. And he takes him all the way back because of the sin that he had in his life. It doesn't say God sent him to hell. It doesn't say God destroyed him. It does say that God buried him. Check it out in Deuteronomy 34. Read that later. Moses, after all the stuff he had to go through with Pharaoh and all this, up to a couple of million of Hebrew people, <laughs> he couldn't make it into the promised land. He wandered in the wilderness for 40 years with the rest of them. He had to gr break groups of people up into different sizes. He had all this leadership ability about himself. <laughs> he couldn't go into the promised land. Well, God is just one oops. What's the big deal? Do you think big deals are important to God? Do you think little things are important to God? Sure they are. So Joshua became the one who was going to carry the banner and the flag from that point on. And in Deuteronomy chapter 1, it tells the incredible passage. Because what they had to learn, what Caleb was telling us, look what it says in verse 7 and verse 8, yes. Caleb is speaking and he says, that the number one challenge that you have to learn, men, father figures, whoever you are, and anyone else who's willing to comply to this, women, men, boys, girls, teenagers, courage, not the one in the words of Oz, the one he's saying here. He says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh means holy. Barnea means wandering around. So, <laughs> that's like a lot of us. We just kind of, we're holy, but we're just walking in circles sometimes. <laughs> Kadesh Barnea, that's the place where God wanted them to go. There's something real special about it. He says, he wanted me to go explore the land, and I brought him back a report according to my convictions, but my brothers who went with me made the hearts of the people uh, melt with fear. Uh, they influenced them with fear. You see, leadership is influence, and they influence the people to be fearful, Therefore, he says, I, however, follow the Lord my God wholeheartedly with courage. What he's trying to help us to see here today is that the power of influence is very strong. It's strong for you and for me that if we will trust God and realize that he's leading us, God will use us to influence other people. But if we get enough people and we disagree with something, and we strike fear into it. I've seen it happen through the church in years. All churches I've been a part of. I've seen it in every one. There's always someone who gets the ear of someone. And it's like they want to dump garbage on another person's front yard, if you will. And the other people, instead of saying, you can't dump that on my yard. They just are afraid to say something. They're intimidated. But those who say, hey, you can't dump that. Go pick that up. Take it over. Dump it someplace else. You can't dump it here. Those people of courage is who we're talking about. Caleb was one of those people who said, I'm a person who can think on my own. I'm not going to be intimidated by you. you remember just a, another passage a few weeks ago we talked about a young man named David. And he stood up against a Goliath, the giant. If you've ever seen a church shuttle outside, it's a little over 8 feet high, maybe 8 foot, 8 inches high, something like that. So add about another foot on top of that, and that's about how tall Goliath supposedly was. 
And David, this little boy, was simply not intimidated by that big giant. Why? Because he wasn't coming in his original sin. He wasn't coming in his own strength. He wasn't coming in with all the powerful figure that he had. He says, I come against you in the name of the Lord my God. You and I can't do it on our own. There's no class, pastor, evangelist, church board leader, teacher, anyone. You can't, we can't do it on our own. It must come only through the power of the Lord our God. Amen? It doesn't happen any other way. When you do it yourself, when you work it all out, when you wait to the last minute to make it happen, you know what happens? The original sin slides in to make you look good and sometimes making other people look bad. But Caleb said, here's what had happened. They came and struck fear. They had 12 people. In, in Deuteronomy, it tells a part of it too, and it tells where the destruction where it broke down and those who weren't going to go in also into the promised land like Moses. However, God buried Moses, but these were not going to be buried by God. They were going to be destroyed because of what they had done. Now, I don't know what God did with them. We don't have a clear answer for that. But I know they didn't go into the promised land, but two of them did. Out of 12 men who were sent out by Moses to go spy out Kadesh Barnea, to go find out what it was about, they found out this, that there were giants in the land, the fruit was flowing, it was a great place, but they were so intimidated by all the stuff that they were fearful of, and 10 of them said, ooh, they're too big, ooh, we can't handle it, ooh, it's just too much, we can't do it. But Joshua and Caleb came out of there saying, Hey, they're just the right size. We know where they're at. We can handle them. God, you will empower us, and, and we'll do whatever you want us to do. The problem was, the ten outweigh the voice and the vote of two. Therefore, Robert's rules of order have come into existence ever since. Amen. <laughs> we needed some kind of a standard, I guess. They lost. In, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 2, it says... It takes about 11 days to travel from Sinai to Kadesh Barnea. Some people have figured it out, and I don't know the actual math of this, of how fast someone has a gait and stride and how fast you can walk in 15 minutes of time. One person has figured this out and said, supposedly, you can walk up to three to four miles an hour um, to where this amount of 11 days it would take about 330 miles to cover 11 days. In other words, um, they didn't have real far to go. Whatever 300 miles is from here, let's say if you go west to Pensacola, it's about 200, a little bit over 200 miles. I don't know how far it is, say, 300 miles south in Florida, how far we need to go. Um, however, I do know this, about 330 miles, when you travel that distance alone, it would take 11 days, supposedly, what, I mean, from what they were saying about walking. And when they came out because of the disobedience, God tells Moses in Deuteronomy 1, He says, take the route of the Red Sea. And Moses is by questioning, uh, 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 oh, okay, do we, you, let me get this right. You're saying take the path to the Red Sea. He said, yes. And it's almost why. He tells in the passages about 12 through 14, 15, he said, because of their disobedience. But Caleb will make it into the promised land. He and his inheritance. And then he says to Moses, he says, and your servant Joshua will also make it into the promised land because Joshua and Caleb did exactly what I wanted them to do. What I told you to come back, he said, I have already, and he tells it in Deuteronomy 1. He says about verse 6, he says, you need to stand up. It's time to... Get out of this area and go to the place that I've told you where to go. You see, he also goes in and says, I have already promised this inheritance to you. Sometimes we as people, we get a little nervous about listening to voices that we can't see physical features with. And we wonder about sometimes the self-talk, maybe that goes inside of the human brain. Is this really from God? Do I need to really understand? It's kind of like me. Um, the other day, uh, I guess it was yesterday, I had a lot to go on. It was yesterday morning. Now think about it. I'm sitting in my car, and I looked in the rearview mirror, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it was a highway patrolman. He was right on my bumper. He was, I mean, I could almost see the cracks in his teeth. That's how close he was. 
I said, why does he sell clothes? Then I realized I was the next to go into the car wash, and he was right behind me getting on the car wash. <laughs> but sometimes we see things like that, and we get intimidated almost. Is he going to give me a ticket? Well, he wasn't out to give me a ticket. He was out to get his car washed. And if we're not careful, we get all fixated on those kind of things. And Caleb was trying to remind us you need to have courage to trust in God. When you're doing good things, doing right things, doing the things that God wants you to do, you don't have a need to be fearful. God said he had already promised the, the land to the Hebrew people, which would be part of be Israel. Setting up, God's already looked out. He already knows, even in your life, the things that's about to happen in your life. What he's looking for is all of us to be obedient to his will, to trust in his hand and guidance. Will you have courage when other people around us, at your job, your homes, your families, your relatives, when you go visit them on vacation, the places of school that you go to, wherever you are, the moment that you have an impression in your spirit that says, go talk to that person. Give some money to that person at the street corner. But Lord, they might use it for alcohol. I didn't ask you to <laughs> debate with me over this. I want you to give them money. When you have courage and you trust the Spirit of the Lord, you hear His voice, you just do what you need to do. Amen? Amen. But when you battle with it, that's where the sin nature comes in. And that's why Jesus died in the New Testament, that's what we understand. He died for us so that the power of God could come and do a washing and a cleansing of our heart. We have had many sermons and messages about holiness of heart and life. And we'll keep doing it until the last breath of all of us that we have. But the Bible says in Hebrews, without holiness... No one, no one will see God. Well, how do you get that? You've got to have courage. You've got to trust God. And that's what he's trying to help us to see. Because when you have courage, it helps you to overcome criticism. When you have courage, it helps you to confront the giants in your life. You see, the giants are those folks that I've learned in my ministry days even... I've had people that I've been confronted with a certain uh, things. They'd stand up and boo, scare you. And because of their position and their paternal or maternal leadership influence in the local church, sometimes they try to dictate how you as a pastor, what you will preach, what you do, how you dress, everything about you. And they affect your families. I learned a long time ago to even confront the criticisms and to confront the giants. You know why? Because when you move from one place to the next place, if you don't take care of it at Sinai, he's going to be somewhere towards Kadesh Barnea. And you're just going to be wandering around possibly for 40 years, walking and operating out of fear. God, the Bible says, did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. He wants you to have confidence in who you are, and that every day as you live and thrive to please Him, to do what he says because you have courage in your heart. And he also, this courage when you have it, it helps you that you're no longer afraid of facing the, the personal growth that he's about to give to you. So leadership is influence. I've heard John Maxwell, he's a great man who has been a former pastor and he teaches leaders how to lead leaders. Written a lot of books. And he also says leadership is influence. Whoever you influence, for whatever, for good or for bad, they're going to follow you. Is it going to be for the glory of God, or is it going to be for the glory of us? Amen? Just chew on it. I still love you. Hope you still love me. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> Leaders, here's what they are. And dads, this is for you too. Leaders are learners. You and I never stop learning. Amen? Amen? When we're learning, we build relationships with other leaders. We connect with people who are like us. In other words, when you're a leader and you're making a difference and you're learning, you tend to treat other people with respect. You treat them as like one adult to another adult. You don't look down on them. You're not parental. You're not a child. You're not arguing whether you get in your way or you're demanding, I'm the parent because I said so, you're going to do it or else. It's not that at all. Sometimes someone says, I really feel like we need to do this. And you may not agree with it, but you say, okay, let's give it a shot. Let's try it out. It may be the thing we really need to do. And when you and I treat one another as equals, as adults to an adult, you can be a person of 50 years of age talking with a person of 
10 years of age and treat them with this respect and talk to them as like they're another adult, but using terms that they can understand. And you'll get more help and knowledge out of that 10 year old than will if you demand, throw whips, and force them to put their nose in a circle in the corner on the wall. Amen. Amen. I've been there, done that. Okay, I'm a parent. Got a lot of failure in my life at that time. When you're a leader, thank you, Lord, for allowing me to perspire. I really thank you for the towels, too. I didn't have a big towel. T.D. Jakes, you think, ah, perspire. Man, he's, that man, he's got like a giant towel. Never mind, I'm sitting on here. When you're a learner as a leader, you share responsibility with others. It's not that you have to get the attention. It's that you need to teach them. They need to learn. They need to learn. Moses taught Joshua. Now Joshua's in leadership. Do you know what he's doing? He's, he's teaching other people as well. You share that responsibility when you're a learner and you're a leader. You accept the pain and disappointment and stride. You don't just grumble and complain and, and take the look that's off of someone's wheels before they leave church because you had a disagreement. And they go driving and they have an accident. Don't get any ideas. Please don't do that. Okay? If, if you do that, I don't know anything about it. Okay? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Just wipe that clear for whatever, from all of our minds. But when you're a leader, you tend to be an encourager as well. You try to find ways to help strengthen that person. You become a communicator. You talk with somebody. You don't just say, can't you read my mind? Don't you know what I want? No. You try to work it out. And sometimes you come across and you don't communicate as clear as you need to. And if you blow it and you don't say it right, you need to say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to come across that way. That was not my motive. That's not my intent. So you find an answer somewhere to communicate cleaner as well. When you're a leader, you tend to become very strategic. You know what you want to do. You know where you want to go. And it helps you to see the vision of what needs to happen. But the real thing about a leader, I like especially you dads, you father figures, you need to be spiritual people. You need to be able to trust God no matter what. You need to have courage. The second thing Joshua is teaching us here, look with me in verse uh, 9 and verse 10, is that we need to listen. He teaches us about listening. He says, So on that day Moses declared to me, Caleb, <clears throat> excuse me, the land in which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. What is he talking about? Wholeheartedly? Courage. And now then, just as the Lord promises, he has kept me, Caleb is talking, alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved about wandering. He was out wandering for 40 years in the desert. And Caleb says this, so here I am today, I am 85 years old. He was 40 when Moses sent him out to be one of the spies, one of the 12 spies, and he got stuck wandering for 45 years. They had their 40 years, and now this is five years after they came into the promised land. And at this point, Joshua was ready to help him out. He's 85. And he says that within this understanding, he has listened to God, and he's followed whatever he had to say. Joshua and Caleb wandered in the wilderness because the group as a whole were negative, they were fearful, they said what they couldn't do than rather than what they can do. Some of you know this little thing where I talked about even as far back as August the 6th in 2006. I had folks to make these fists. You see, what happens is when you drive this fear into people's lives, it's like you're wanting to fight because the original sin inside of us says, I'd rather fight than switch. <laughs> I didn't want to say that. But that's what that means. And when you want to do this, that's what his original sin is. You're digging in. You're putting your heels in. You don't want to be told what to do. But when you say things like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and you open up your hand, that's where God wants to come into our life. There's where God can teach you. But when you put your palms down, that's when you allow God to have complete charge of your life and even do the washing within your spirit. I hope that makes sense. He wants to cleanse every one of us. Everyone in this room has been tainted by sin. The key is, are any of us in this room today, have we been washed, not just in the blood, but by the Spirit of the Most High God? Is the Holy Spirit of God, is He in charge of your thoughts? Is He in charge of your tongue? Is He in charge of your emotions? Is He in charge of the directions and the will of your very spirit and life? He wants to. That's His whole mission. Because that's who Jesus was. 
And the New Testament tells us that Jesus did what the Father wanted Him to do. That's what we need to do. He said, listening. And He also said the third challenge was, for us, for fathers, is trust. Look at verse 11, 12, and 13. I'm, I'm wrapping this up. He says, I am still as strong. This is Caleb talking. He says, I'm still faithfully trusting God. Today, I'm 85 years old. <laughs> he says, I'm still doing it as much as when Moses called me 45 years ago and sent me out. I'm just as energetic to go out to the battle now as I was then. Now give me the hill country that the Lord promised me that day. What day? Deuteronomy chapter 1. Check that out later. You yourself heard that the Anakites were there, the giants, and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me. Can you say the Lord will help me? The Lord. That's what he's saying. The Lord was helping me, and I will drive them out just as he said, as God said. Not because of the way we figured it all out, but what letting God. It's not we ask God to come and join us. We need to join in what God is doing. What God is blessing. We need to join Him. Amen? That's what He's wanting. Uh, and then He says, Joshua blessed Caleb and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. Hebron is about roughly, it's just south of Jerusalem. It's like, how far is it from here to a capital circle, Thomasville Road, to go into Georgia? 15 miles maybe? Is it that far? Imagine it's about that far. From here to the state line, if you go up Thomasville Road, that's about how far away he was from Jerusalem. That's pretty close. Courage, listening, trust. Anyone over, anyone under, anyone under 49 years of age here today? A few of you. I see, Simi. I saw you raise your hand back there. <laughs> about 49 years ago, in a time between about 1969 to 1972, there was a TV show when I was a teenager. A very, very young teenager. <laughs> very young teenager. And it came on, and I used to watch it. It was on for about three seasons. I couldn't miss it. It was great. And it was called The Courtship of Eddie's Father. It was one of the first shows I had seen talked about a single parent who was raising a child. And yet in that show, he demonstrated, Bill Bixby, who played as the Incredible Hulk and played some other shows as well, Mr. Ed and the, My Favorite Martian and some of those shows. He, uh, he demonstrated his adult-to-adult -adult look. In other words, he treated the respect of his son, Eddie. He was young, and he was able to talk with him. And many times, Eddie would come back and talk with him. And they had this great relationship. I, I want to show you the difference between analog signals and what the copying like was like back then to digital today was no, not so nice and clean and sharp. And I, want, I have a little about a one minute clip. Can we play that, Andrew? I want you to hear the song. It's very catching. It's got words you can do a single one. Tell you about my best friend. He's a warm-hearted person. He loved me till the end. He got the people let me tell you about my best friend. someone's example. You see, in this passage, why, even though he was a single parent, he learned to love his son. Now, hold on. I have one more video, if you'll hang in there. One more video. And it's about a man who's like this video, but where he had been told that his son had a condition and that he is a, an adult. He and his wife would not have a normal family unless he institutionalized his son. He says, your son was born this way, he's got a terrible illness, 
and uh, it's a mess. This man eventually what it came to be, his son even couldn't communicate with him until later years they had a computer system where it somehow connected to his thoughts and was able to speak and could talk out loud. I want you to see this video about a man who learned how to be an Iron Man because he, he got the communication from his son that he liked to be in some kind of a marathon race. He says, son, you can't walk. You have to be carried everywhere you go. You can't talk. You have no real motor uh, abilities for physically walking. Look what this dad did. It's called Team Point. Very motivating. Watch what happens. Look at the love this father had for his son. Can you forward it up just to about 109? Well, I'm sorry, just let it go. It's okay. Just let it go. It's okay. Run a marathon with Dad, can you run another marathon with me? Father says, yes. And run another marathon together. And one day the son asked the father, Dad, would you please do the Iron Man with me? <coughs> triathlon. And just in case you wouldn't know, the Iron Man is the toughest triathlon in existence. Four kilometers swimming, 108 kilometers by bike, and finally another 42 by running in one stroke. The father said, Yes. Is there anything too hard for us to love our children? And now we have sound. Who told the sun where to stand in the morning? And who told the ocean you can only come this far? And who showed the moon where to hide till evening? Whose words alone can catch a falling star? Yeah.
Humanity has a disability. It's called sin. And yet our Father God loved us so much that He sent His Son Jesus Christ to die for us. To become a penalty of sin where we should deserve death. That we should be institutionalized. That we should be left alone. Because Jesus had it all great. Everything was fine in heaven. Why would He have to come down here and become like us? Because the incredible love the Father has for us. So great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we would become, be called the children of God and that is who we are. My friends, today you are loved. God loves you. There's no one in the world who's never had been perfect. There's people I meet all the time who says, I'll go to church when I'm perfect. <laughs> That'll never happen, I guess. We have imperfect people in this church today. All of us are imperfect. But when we have courage in the Father, and we'll listen to the Father, and we'll put our trust in the Father, incredible things will happen. Here's how I'd like this to close today if we could. I'd like to invite your families, if you're sitting together, if you would stand, all of you stand together with me today, would you do that? And if you see someone here today who doesn't have a family, maybe you can invite them or go to where they are and be a part of their family as well. I'd like all of you who would stand. And I know it's Father's Day, we're looking at it that way, and the father figures and so on. And the moment as you leave, there's a gift for all of you men as you leave today as well. But what I'd like for you to do, I like as I lead us in prayer and closing, I'd like for you to gather around your families. And I'd like you to just pray and hold hands if you need to, whatever you need to do. But I'd love for you, like it used to be in the Old Testament, there was a time where when Moses' hands were down, the Amalekites were beating Israel. But when Aaron and Hur lifted up his hands, they were victorious. Today, I want you to lift your family up and let them be victorious. Andrea, you can come down where you are and stand with your family as well, if you like. We're not going to sing. Just want to close in prayer. But I want all of you to be with family. I don't want anyone to be alone. Again, if you see someone who's not together, join with them, okay? Amen? Amen. Would bow with me if you would. Let's close and let's trust God to take care of us even in these days. Our Father God, we thank you for this day and we thank you for your grace and your leadership in our lives. We thank you for the lessons you've taught us in this message today. And we pray that our courage and our listening and our trust will be in you. Today, Lord, I ask that everyone that's in this room will say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and forgive me of my sin. Lord Jesus, you're our best friend. You are the best friend we could ever ask for. And I pray that we'll relinquish the sin in our life and allow you to do the cleansing in our spirit. And let us have the thoughts, the choices, the emotions, the desire in our spirit to serve the Lord God and Him only. Don't look to the left. Don't look to the right. But trust you, O oh God, through Jesus Christ by the power of your Holy Spirit. May these dads, these men, may these godly people here today not see themselves as work, weak worms of the dust, don't let them see themselves today as impossible. Don't let them see themselves as failures. Don't let them see themselves today as wheelchair bound. Don't let them see themselves today that it's impossible and there's nothing they can do. Let them see themselves today, every one of us today, as children of the Most High God who has a favor, has love, had desire to lift us up, to encourage us, to press us on, to push us through the battles of life and become victorious children of God. Lord, you see us as someone who has overcome the enemy because we put our trust in your Son through Jesus Christ. And because of that, <laughs> greater are you, Lord Jesus, in us than he that is in this world. We are more than conquerors because you love us, Lord, and we love you. So continue to do your work in each and every one and every home. Bless every home that's here today, O oh Lord. And as we leave this house, may we realize that we have the same confidence of courage, listening, and trust as Caleb and Joshua. For the glory of God, amen. 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 God's good. Do you, do you believe it today? Do you trust God? Amen. Give Him glory. Amen. He's so good. Trust in Him. Don't be afraid. Trust in God. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.